Okay, here's um, our final lesson on mechanical energy. And <clears throat> we're looking at the conservation of energy as it applies to some of the concepts that we've talked about before. Um, potential energy, kinetic energy, and so on and so forth. So in the previous two lessons, really that's what we've been discussing, kinetic and potential, and the energy that's associated with motion and then the energy that's stored. Um, but really, these types of energy are two halves to a whole. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to observe kind of um, um, scenarios and situations where we've got energy that's transforming from one form into another because that's what the conservation of energy tells us. So we're at a point where we can start to put these things together and look at one of the most fundamental laws of science. So let's think for a moment, thought experiment, let's think about a Ferrari coming to a screeching halt. Um, and what types of energy do we observe right away? Well, first of all, if it's screeching to a halt, its tires are grinding on the concrete, we would see heat energy. Those tires are going to be pretty hot. Um, and, of course, that's due to friction, energy of friction. We would also have, of course, keyword being screeching. We would have some sound energy that would be released in that. Um, and there would probably be... Um, a certain, um, certain amount of air resistance or air currents that would be created. So we have all these, you know, the you know, this car is coming to a screeching halt, and we have all these types of energy that are being released. Okay? We know, though, that this energy can't come from nowhere. So where does the energy come from? Is it created? Like, do, is this energy created, or does it come from somewhere else? And it really, the answer is found in basically saying, okay, well, let's think about the moment right before it started to come to a stop. It was traveling at a speed v, and so it had a fair amount of kinetic energy. And in the process of coming to a stop, that kinetic energy was transferred to the other sources. So this is an example of the conservation of energy. And the conservation of energy by textbook definition states that energy cannot be created nor destroyed, but only transformed from one form to another without any loss. Okay, so let's think about um, a very straightforward example. A crane lifts a 1,500 kilogram car to a height of 14 meters above the ground. Okay? And then it drops the car. So let's think about a whole bunch of different moments in this little experiment. Let's calculate what the gravitational potential energy of the car is at the top. So it's, when that car has been lifted to 14 meters, how much gravitational potential energy does it have at the top? And so what we can say is, well, we know that the mass is 1,500 kilograms, and we know that the change in height from the ground, which presumably we're marking as zero, to a height of 14 meters, um, is given by mg delta h. And so if we make this calculation, we find about 205,800 joules at the top. So 2.1 times 10 to the 5 joules. So that's a lot of energy that this car has, a lot of potential energy. In part B, the, the question says, what's the kinetic energy of the car the instant before it hits the ground? So let's ask ourselves what's happened, because basically at the top where this car is sitting in the crane's jaws, the car's not moving. It's got a speed of zero, which means it has a kinetic energy of zero. It's got tons of potential energy, though, that's stored in gravity. And when the crane lets that go, the car falls to the ground, building up speed along the way. And the instant before it hits the ground, like the instant before it hits the ground, its height would be, of course, zero. So what's happened during this fall is that the potential energy that's stored in the car at the top has started to 
transfer its way to becoming kinetic energy because if it's got no speed at the top we know that when you drop something from rest it builds up speed and then it hits the ground so we know that the speed has gone from zero to some number but what's the potential energy gone from it's gone from 2.1 times 10 to the fifth joules in this case to at a height of zero the potential energy is zero. So all the potential energy has now been dumped into kinetic energy. And so what we can say is, is that if there was an equation that governed the conservation of energy, this might be it. Energy initial is equal to energy final. And what we could say is, is that, hey, initially what type of energy does the car have? Well, it's got potential energy. Finally, what kind of energy does the car have? Well, it's got kinetic energy. And so we could say that energy initial is equal to energy final, and so the kinetic energy that the car must have at the end is equal to 2.1 times 10 to the fifth joules. It's got to have the same amount of energy it had at the beginning, just a little bit of a different form, because it had potential, now it's got kinetic. So in question C, it now says, what's the velocity of the car the instant before it hits the ground? Well, now that we know how much kinetic energy we have, we can solve for the velocity. And so we get 205,800 joules, and that's equal to 1 half mv squared. And if we solve this, we find that the final speed of the car, the instant before it hits the ground, is 16.6 .6 meters per second. So the potential energy at the top and the kinetic, en kinetic energy at the bottom are the same, the speed of the car upon impact, 17 meters per second. How difficult is it to prove the conservation of energy? Very, very, very tough. Let's actually try and prove it just through thought experiment with two things that we know well, a baseball um, and later a tennis ball. So here's a baseball, we're gonna drop it to the ground and of course it bounces a couple times. Here's a tennis ball and we're gonna drop it to the ground and of course it bounces but it rebounds a little bit higher than the baseball does because tennis balls are more bouncy. But for both of these cases we notice that the height of the ball either one never returns to its initial vertical position. And that doesn't mean that energy has been destroyed, but it's been lost. So it's basically been transferred to its surroundings. Because if the conservation of energy really existed just between kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy, then this baseball, when we drop it, should rebound right back up into our hands. Same with the tennis ball. But of course it doesn't because there's tons of other types of energy that are at work here. So if we were able to assemble like tons of little probes to measure with the, you know this unprecedented accuracy all the ways that energy was lost in the example above, we would find that the conservation of energy is indeed a law of science. Because there's tons of things that are going on when you drop a baseball or drop a tennis ball that of course you don't see because they're elastic, um, you know, their, their elasticity, and there's elastic potential energy. Of course, they always make a noise, so there's some sound energy that's lost. Really, there's probably a lot of energy that's lost to air resistance, because as you drop um, something, it's falling through the air, and that creates um, losses in energy. So there's tons of stuff that's going on. Um, and, you know, some of those things would be friction, there'd be elastic potential energy that we'd lose. Of course, we lose sound air resistance, there's probably all kinds of microscopic deformation of the material when it hits the ground. And so, for our purposes, in this course, we're going to ignore many of those elements in our problem solving. And as we learn more about the nature of these forces, our analysis of the conservation of energy will become more and more complete. And so as you progress through your education, you'll learn about how friction affects the conservation of energy. You'll learn about perhaps how 
um, elastic potential energy affects the conservation of energy, etc., etc. Here's another example. In an attempt to foil a robbery, Superman, in uncharacteristically mean form, hurls a 0.5 kilogram stone at 200 meters per second towards a crook on the ground. If Superman's flying at a height of 350 meters, find the velocity of the stone the instant before it hits the 1.5 meter tall crook on the top of his head. So here's our situation. We got Superman up top. He throws a stone. It's going to hit this crook in the head. The mass of the stone we know is 0.5 kilograms. Its initial velocity, Superman throws it with an initial velocity of 200 meters per second. Superman's height, where he releases the stone, is 350 meters above the ground. It's traveling to a location where it hits this uh, very tall crook at 1.5 meters because it hits him on the top of his head. So the ball's actually not traveling from 350 meters to zero. It's actually traveling from 350 meters to 1.5 meters because that's where the top of the head is located. So let's start with our you know, general formula for the conservation of energy. Energy initial is equal to energy final. And so we ask ourselves, okay, initially, what type of energy does the stone have? And really, the answer is pretty straightforward. You can say, does it have kinetic energy? Does it have potential energy? Because that's all we're dealing with right now. And so the answer is, does it have potential energy? Yeah, that stone is way up in the air. It's at 350 meters. Does it have kinetic energy? Yeah, because he throws it at 200 meters per second. So we know it has both of these types of energy. And so we will, we will give each of these a subscript of 1 to represent that's what it has at position 1. Finally, when it hits the crook on the top of the head, so now really we're considering the starting spot where Superman releases it, and the ending spot, the final spot, where it hits the crook. Does it have potential energy? Yeah, because it hits the crook on the top of the head, so 1.5 meters above the ground. Does it have kinetic energy? Oh yeah, it's traveling pretty fast. So we have potential and kinetic, and we'll indicate this with a subscript of 2, because this is um, basically saying this is the second position where we, um, where we want to analyze. So now, let's put in our um, formulas here, MGH1. 1 half mv1 squared, okay, and that's equal to mgh2 plus 1 half mv2 squared. And because we're talking about the stone, what mass are we talking about? We're talking about the velocity of the stone. We're not talking about the velocity of Superman or the crook or anything like that. We're talking about the velocity of the stone. Well, we're talking about potential energy of the stone, kinetic energy of the stone, and so all of these masses, because they appear in each term, are a common factor. And so we can cancel them. We don't have to, but we can. Because it kind of makes problem solving a little bit less cumbersome. Less numbers, the better. And so this is what we're left with. Now be very careful when you cancel masses. If one of these terms had had no mass in it, we could not have done this. The only reason we can do this is because mathematically we can factor out this common factor of m and it, it reduces on both sides, so it simplifies out. And so now we're at a point where we know all these unknowns and we can sub them in and we're left with v2 squared as our final unknown. We can rearrange, we can simplify. And what we end up with is, of course, 216.4 meters per second after we take the square root. And so the stone then, just before it hits the crook in the head, is traveling at 216.4 meters per second.